with our first sermon of this 12-week series entitled, So, Which One of Us is God? The great French painter Paul Gauguin, for six years as a young man, as a teen, was enrolled in the seminary. And the head of the seminary asked the students three fundamental questions of life that Gauguin would later portray in a painting that included a figure like Eve reaching up for an, a for an apple. In French, the painting was titled, D'où venons-nous, que sommes-nous, ou allons-nous? In English, where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Three pretty good fundamental questions for all of life, for every man and woman. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? I want us to look at those three questions in the catechism that Jesus and God has been teaching us throughout the Bible and that they taught Gauguin in seminary. Right? What's it? Uh, to, to quote an old song, and some of you remember this, What's it all about, Alfie? Right? That, that's the question. What is life all about? Is there meaning and is there purpose to life? And if so, can we know it? Can we be properly guided? And can we proceed toward a goal where life makes sense and has true meaning? Not just for now, but for Forever, exactly, but for forever. And as we go through this sermon series, I want to identify the covenants along the way that God has made between himself and humanity. And the first of these covenants is the one he made in Eden called the Edenic covenant. covenant. And this one God made before the fall of man. So let's pick up in Genesis 2, 7 through 9. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Literally, in Robert Alt's translation, he basically says that, that from hummus, right? Hummus, you, you, know, you know soil and, and peat and hummus, the stuff you put on your gardens? Alt says literally is as though God is so powerful he could take common garden soil and breathe life into it and became a man. He formed the dust from he formed the man of dust from the ground. So we have to remember that we are part and parcel with this earth. We are creatures. We have been created and formed. We didn't just spontaneously appear. We didn't make ourselves. And everything we have, we have because of God. From the very breath in our lungs to any chance for hope and purpose in our lives. Just like us, God also made the animals from the dust, but with one clear distinction. What does it say? After God formed man from the soil, after he formed us as humans, we still didn't have life. It wasn't until what? God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and that's when man became a living creature. Man is set above the animals as a steward over creation and is greater than the animals. Don't let folks tell you you're no, you came from and are no better than an ape because that's not what the scripture says. But we have a proper place above the animals 
but below God. And the fact that we have any life at all is only because God has made it so. The very same God who set the universe and the planets and the stars in their places <coughs> as, a, as an exploding, roiling, supercharged mass and yet it had all come out in perfect order, in perfect orbit, in perfect harmony, in perfect expansion, in perfect temperature, in perfect confluence of all the things needed to make life on this earth. The very same God who has been from everlasting, has always existed, who could by the word of his mouth simply say, let there be the heavens. Let there be the earth. Let there be light. And all that we see came to fruition. That very same God had it in his mind to make Steve and Joe and Ellen and Mary Ann and Marie. He had it in his mind to say, it's not enough to make the stars and the planets I need to make the sons and the daughters people created in my likeness. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. Now, the word there for garden is not a vegetable plot so much as like an orchard or a park lined with trees. And the word Eden means a well-watered place. And he made this garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Notice that God took Adam, right, which, you know, coming from the earth, he took Adam and he placed him in the garden. Adam had been in the wild, but God didn't need a wild man. He, Thank goodness, yes, he needed a, a civil man, a man who would be after God's own likeness. Yes, guys, we are made from the earth. We are made to love the earth, and there's nothing wrong with being an outdoors guy at all. But God put, put man in the garden so that he could have relationship and communion and not be by himself. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the second tree, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right Now, lest you think that God was just an either-or God, notice that he says he didn't just make two trees, a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God made to spring up what? Every tree that is pleasant to the sight and every tree that is good for food. Folks, how many trees are there? How many kinds of trees are there on this earth? From the great redwoods and sequoias to the oak and the elm and the pine, from the, the apple tree and the pear tree and the orange tree and the peach tree, Think of all the bushes and all the trees that are good for fruit. For food. Think of all the bushes and all the trees that contain uh, uh, nuts and, and, and pineapples and, and pomegranates and figs. God created all those just for us. Just to give us bounty and variety. Oh, what a gracious and great and loving God we serve. Then it says, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you surely, you shall surely die. Now, the first part of God's covenant in Eden comes from chapter one. And it says where God is speaking, the Father is speaking to each member of the Trinity, he says, let us make man, verse 26, then God said, Genesis 1, 26, 
Let us make man in our image. That's the Father and the Son and the Spirit all conferring with a plan to make us like himself, like themselves. Right? He's not speaking to the angels because we are not made in the image of the angels. We are made in the image of God. Amen. And God says, let us do this. Let us make man after our likeness. And he says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock, over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created man, right? Now, look at how God completed his image. Male and female, he created them. God's likeness and image expressed in and through and to humanity would not have been complete with only Adam. When God said of Adam, you need a helpmate, it's not good for you to be alone, I'm going to make one who Adam would call Isha, because I am Ish. She's so close to me that one letter separates us. Man, woman, Ish, Isha. They're so close, and yet they're different. They are complementary. And God could not express his full likeness in humanity without also making women. This tells us that women do not ever take a back seat in the plan and order and hierarchy of God. Yes, God does set a hierarchy and an order, but in order to express his likeness in humanity, he had to create women as well as men. Let's continue. So, our first covenant with God is the one that's found where Adam has a, God has a plan, he's making man in his image, he says God blessed them and God said to them, now here are his commands to the first man and the first women. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the whole earth. We've got that part down. Seven billion later, we figure that part out. <clears throat> Subdue the earth and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God says, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that's on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit you shall have them for food. So God knew how he created us, who he had created. He created folks in his likeness, and he knew what we needed. Now, I got to tell you, folks, barbecue is okay. Steaks, God says we can eat. But it didn't start out that way. When God really wanted us to start out healthy, he basically said, I'm giving you fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, and legumes. That's the way you're going to be healthy. The word is the word, folks. Sorry. You know, all the granola eaters, they got the word on their side. What are we going to say? Later on, God said, it's all right. You can have steak and all these other things. But here, God said, I want you healthy. I want you happy. I want you well. And he gave us food. And to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. So God not only took care of the crown of his creation, humanity, God set out to look after all the animals as well and gave them food. God saw everything that he had made. Verse 31, and behold, what? it was good. God had spoken his covenant out to man, and after he had done it, before the fall, he looked at everything that he'd made, and it was good. And then God continued his covenant after 
man had transgressed. Let's keep going. God says, up to now, everything that he made has been good. He made the heavens, he made the earth, he made the light, he made the sun, moon, and stars. Everything's been good, 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 good. The earth, the waters, the beasts, the birds, the fish, the fowl. Good, 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 good. And then God says in chapter 2 of Genesis that something wasn't good. Our second part of the Edenic covenant comes in chapter 2, where it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, verse 16, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So, the covenant was simple. God said, rule over the earth as a steward, have dominion. When God tells Adam to till the earth and to watch over it, it's really a picture of serve the earth and cause it to serve you. Don't be reckless in your stewardship, but as a servant under me, you serve the earth and do what is good for the earth. And if you have proper dominion over it, the earth will do right by you. So the idea there is to, to serve it, to till it, and to watch over it. So the idea there to watch over it is to protect it, to look out for God's creation. What does that tell us? It tells us that we have to conserve as well as consume. It tells us we have to keep clean as well as to use what God has provided. It tells us that if God has made a good earth, we ought to keep it good because we are his stewards. We have dominion over the earth but God has dominion over us. And he says, just like you would tell a child who gets a great present for their use, do you want your child busting up their Christmas present two days after Christmas? Of course not. God says, be good stewards. And then God says, I've given you all these different trees, all the glory, all the bounty, all the variety, all the delight. All these different trees. But there's one that you may not eat of. Just one. Think of how many trees there could possibly have been in that vert place. And there's just one that we are told not to eat of. And guess which one we want? Yeah, the bad one. The one where. And. and it's not even a bad tree in and of itself because when God created the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when he made that tree and looked out over everything he's made, even of that tree, God said it was what? It was good. God didn't make an evil tree. But we made an evil choice. So when we ask ourselves as Gauguin did, where did we come from? We came from a, the mind and the heart and the breath and the word of an omnipotent, omniscient, loving, caring, greatest of all, God. That's where we came from. We came from a paradise where he made a beautiful uh, 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 kingly palace of blue sky and green grass and verdant lush landscape. That's where we came from. We came from a God who gave us his likeness and his image. We were perfect in that we had no sin. But we've got to remember we weren't God. 
So when we ask in this sermon, so which one of us is God? We have to answer. Where do we come from? Folks, we didn't start out as God. Keep that in your mind. And everything up to now has been good, but then God says, it is not good for man to be alone. Very next verse. We're not to be autonomous in answering to no one. We're to be in communion with God and with others. When God says that we're to be together here worshiping on the Lord's day, this is something, as we're all together, this is something of God calling us back to what he intended in Eden. You have something to bring to worship here today. You have something to say in Bible study. You have a part in prayer meeting. We're a church together because we're a human race together. It is good for us to be here together today. It's part of how and why we were made. It's intrinsic within our very nature. And God let man do like he himself has done. Once God had made the animals and brought them to man, and we're going to see that theme again in the Bible. Remember the story of Noah? So God has made the animals and he's brought them to man and he's allowed man to name part of God's creation. Just as God had earlier named his creation, the heavens and the earth, the scripture says God knows the name and has a name for all the stars. So he gave Adam a chance to do like he does in being able to name the animals. And God has given man some autonomy and ability to name what exists in reality. But notice, God has not given man autonomy to falsely name reality. God has not given man the, the autonomy to say, I'm going to declare what's real and what's true and what's not a lie. That power resides with God alone. Then it says, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast and every bird. He allowed Adam to name them. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. They're wonderful. They're great. But there's no compliment for David or Jim or Joe. There's not one yet made like you who can fill in what you need and what you lack, who can be that missing complementary piece, who can help you attain your fullest glory before God. You and we need one another. We need a helpmate. And I'm not getting into a long diatribe, but the female was made for the male and vice versa. Period. End of story. From the beginning to now, God's word hasn't changed even if we have. So, let's look at what God gave humans. God gave us life, immortal life, not just existence, but he gave us existence as his crown of creation. We had life with God. We were loved by God. We're cared for by God. We're talking and we're interacting with God. We're learning from God. Worshiping, yes, but also fellowshipping, not as equals, but as loved and respected and cared for children of God, sons and daughters. He gave us not only his life, but his likeness. We have creativity and intelligence and understanding, the ability to work and to name and to communicate and to discern. We have the ability from God to speak and to hear, to reason and to remember. We have luxury. We have life and likeness. We also had luxury. In Eden, there was no need for clothes or shoes or rain. 
The climate was temperate. The temperature pleasantly warm. The ground was soft and safe. No thorns or thistles. The animals were domesticated and peaceful. Food was abundant. And we could eat of any of the trees except one. We had power and purpose and protection. We had the power to be, as it were, a mediator between God and His creation. Creation would obey humans, so to speak. The animals would come to Adam. We had a certain degree of power. We had a purpose. We were to till and take care of this, this well-watered orchard. Work was not strenuous work. The land yielded its goodness naturally. And we had protection. Adam was taken from the wild and placed in a garden. Satan would be present in that garden, but Satan didn't have to be a grave threat to us. He didn't have to be. We're coming to that. So not only did we have life and luxury and lightness, power, purpose, and protection, we also had family and freedom. We had God first as our family and one another second. Always that order. And we had freedom. God gave us so that we could truly and freely love and not just be puppets or robots. For there's no other way to create a loving race of sons and daughters. There's no other way but to give us the freedom to choose to love. But with that freedom comes the, cho the choice not to love God. The freedom to choose to learn, but also the freedom to choose to reject what we've learned. The freedom to search and to ask questions, but also the freedom to go with the wrong answers. The freedom to follow and obey or renounce and reject. God gave us freedom, and that's what it means to be humans under God. And there's no other way that He could create us. Did it allow for the possibility? That sin could come in? Yes, just like it did in the angelic realm. But there's no other way for God to truly be God and His creatures to truly trust and worship Him of their own volition unless they have their own volition. There's no other way. So we come from, where do we come from to who are we? What are we? Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Notice how Satan gets us. We're going to outline exactly, but notice what he does. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Then she adds something that we've never heard before in Scripture. Neither shall you touch it. Where'd she get this? Well, we humans do have a tendency to add extra stuff to what God has said, yes? We do have a tendency to make up our own pet rules that God may not necessarily have said. Maybe Adam was not being the protector and provider and watch care and help that he should have been to eat. When, when she said this, why, why did Adam not correct her? Maybe he hadn't told her right. We don't know for sure, but she's come up with some extraneous non-scripture, the first wrong human religious tradition, if you will. Now, I understand, you know, when you don't want that kid to touch the stove, sometimes you'll say, not only don't touch it, but stay out of the kitchen altogether. Right? But that wasn't what God had said. Let's continue. But the serpent said to the woman, You won't surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of his fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her? Who was with her and he ate? 
Now, yes, Adam was with Eve in the garden. Was he with her right there when the Satan when Satan was tempting her? We don't know. But if he had been, I'm putting a lot on Adam, not just Eve. Amen, fellas? Yes. So we see what God gave us. What did Satan give humans to make us who and what we are? Well, the first thing Satan gave us was lying about God's goodness. He basically was telling them, God is not fair and just. He's not kind and loving. And God is keeping something from you that you need. He not only lied about God's goodness, he lied about God's intentions. He doesn't want you to know what he knows, Satan says. And he doesn't want you to know that for the wrong reasons. Because God is jealous, he's power hungry, he's selfish, he's uncaring. These are all the kind of ideas that go with you need something that God's not providing. Folks, before the explosion, there's usually a long fuse leading up to it. Before you commit that last final sin, you're usually thinking along the way a lot of thoughts that lead up to it. Satan lied about God's goodness, God's intention. Now he lies about God's word. What did he say? He asked first. Did he really say it? He gets Eve to question whether she's heard right and whether God knew what he was talking about. And finally he says, God was lying and doesn't know right from wrong. You won't surely die. And then he mixes a little bit of truth in after he says God is lying. He says God knows when you eat it, you're going to be like him in knowing good and evil. That is true. But what he's lying about is God's and humans' place and power. God has a place and power that we are not to have. You can be God yourself, is what Satan said, and you can take his place. That's what Satan gave us. And what did we give God? We gave God a refusal to repent. After we sin, God says, Adam, where are you? Now, God knows everything. Did God know where Adam and Eve were? Yes. He was giving them a chance to come out, come clean, fess up, repent, and get right. Adam, where are you? Is a marvelous statement. Where are you in your life right now? Where are you in your thinking? Where are you in your behavior? Where are you in whether you serve God or whether you don't? It's not about location. It's about relation. And Adam and Eve come out saying, we hid from you. For the first time, they hid from God. We were na we, because we were naked. Now they felt ashamed. Had they been naked before? Sure. Did it matter? No. But now they were naked and ashamed and fearful. And it didn't have anything to do with a lack of clothes. It had to do with a lack of righteousness. They didn't need to put on BVDs. They needed to put on the truth of God and to have gone to God, their master and maker, and said, God, we heard something. It doesn't sound right to us. We're coming to you to check it out and see, is this something we should do? And they didn't do it. And God gives them a chance to repent and come clean. And immediately, human sin has taken hold and begins to break and pervert and destroy two relationships. For when Adam is asked about this, he says, not my fault. God, the woman that you gave me. This woman that he was just rejoicing over. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Now she's just, this woman. Doesn't even call her by name. This woman whom you gave me. God, it's her fault. God, it's 
your fault, but God, it's not my fault. Folks, is that human sin in a nutshell? Rationalize instead of repent when we are revealed to be unrighteous. And then he asked Eve, well, what, what, what is this you've done? It's the serpent's fault. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Not my fault. What humans gave God was refusal to repent. And we're still doing it. Instead of Adam fessing up and saying, I'm sorry, or Eve saying, I shouldn't have done this. How can I make this right? We gave God ingratitude. God, what you give us isn't enough. We gave him deception. God, what you said wasn't true. We gave him rejection. What God does isn't to be, re isn't to be trusted. We gave God blame. This isn't our fault. You created this mess. And eventually, when we give God all that, we are going to assume, arrogate, annex, and annihilate. This is who we are. We assume we know better than God. We arrogate which means to claim or seize something for ourselves without justification. We've tried to take this earth over as though we are God, and we do not have that claim or that right. Not only have we assumed and arrogated wrongly, we have annexed possessions or land for ourselves as though they come from somewhere besides God. And even now, we seek after all that to annihilate God to remove his existence from our world. That's what humanity gave back to God for all that he gave us. That's where we came from. That's who we, and what we are. Where are we going? Well, within a verse, after the curse, God pronounces a curse. Adam, now your work's going to be much harder. Now, instead of you being able to subdue creation, now you have flipped the script, Adam, and now there will be thorns and thistles, and creation will make things harder for you. What you should have protected and what should have provided for you is now made worse because of what you've done. You had dominion over that serpent, and now you've given that serpent dominion over you. Because you didn't come to me. But within a verse after the curse, a Savior is promised. Eve, childbirth is going to be hard. Adam, work is going to be hard. But God says, yet I will be, bring grace after immediate judgment. The seed of woman who will come will be a Savior who will be the scourge of Satan. God says to make this right, I myself am going to come to you in the form of of a Savior. God kicked man out of Eden. He evicted him. But before you say, well, God did that because he was mad and he was mean and he's just vindictive, safety and security came because we got kicked out. By censuring man's sovereignty, man would not be permitted to live in a place where his immortal life would be marked and tainted with sin and shame and separation forever. Remember there are two trees. Tree of immortal life in the garden. But now man is living a life separated from God by sin and living in fear and shame. And God says, I don't want you to live forever in fear and shame. Amen? And so he kicks him out in order to preserve and save Adam and Eve. God allowed the evil angel Satan to make his case against God. But now God will guard us from our own sin and self by ejecting us from Eden. Folks, as we close, you can't have life, immortal life, real life with God, and a lie simultaneously. God cannot be king in your mind and heart if you think you're still the king. That is the hell of it. And we were bent on making a hell out of a 
godly paradise there in Eden. God's still king. He's still sovereign. What he says still goes. And Adam and Eve were now living a lie. In fact, they didn't become more like God. They became less. God can know about sin without sinning. We can't. God always keeps himself spotless. We don't. God made us to be greater than the earth and animals, and suddenly we'd forfeited that place. And now there's death and discord, disease, thorns, and thistles replace soft ground and grass. Easy work becomes toil and tedium. We can't even best a snake now without God's help. What do we never read in this story? Adam and Eve and God coming together before sin so God could help his children. When you sin, it isn't because you momentarily forsake fellowship with God. It's because you don't ask all along. You don't ask for knowledge or strength or protection. You don't ask for help or stamina or patience or understanding or wisdom. We go it alone in trying to make ourselves God. And God said from the very first, it is not good for man to be alone. God loves us and he won't allow us to turn a paradise into a hell. And he doesn't want us to live forever in fear and shame. So God decides to give falling and wonder where